Today is May 23rd, 1975, and I'm in Jer- Jerusalem, and I'm interviewing Mr. Henry Levy. That's the way you pronounce your name, isn't it? Levy. Levy. Okay, first of all, um, I'd like to know when, uh, where, and under what circumstances did you first come into professional contact with an American Jewish chaplain with regard to the remnants of European Jewry? My first contact with a uh, Jewish chaplain in the uh, United States Army on a professional basis. For the remnants? For the remnants of uh, Jewry, that is, those who had survived the concentration camps, those who came out of hiding, those who had been taken care of by non-Jewish spouses, those who had managed to survive in the 101 different ways in which some of the individuals survived. The first Jewish chaplain on my being assigned to uh, Berlin in uh, the latter part of 1945, December, latter part of December, early part of January 1945, was... uh, uh, the chaplain Schubau. Uh, his first name was Joseph, Joseph Schubau. S C H S C H U B O W. U B O W. One should mention at this point that the name of Schubau <laughs> had preceded our entry there. And we were told uh, a little bit about uh, the kind of a man he was, namely that he was a volatile sort of a guy, highly temperamental, delivered emotional speeches, was very active, and that he uh, had been doing some work with the GIs and even with the German Jewish community in Berlin. We had also been told that he had had certain personal difficulties with our predecessor, with mine and with my teammate's predecessor, uh, the director of the joint operation in uh, Berlin, uh, Phil Skornick, as well as with the sergeant, David Eisenberg, I believe, David Mm -hmm. Eisenberg, who had in... uh, who had in a... uh, a way in which I really don't know, he had come to take over certain activities for the, for the, uh, uh, displaced persons in and around Berlin at the time. With Schubau, I personally found a, uh, a fairly happy relationship. He was a man who was a great activist. He was always running to the the jails or the stockades to help Jewish GIs. For whatever reason, which had led to their incarceration, you could be sure that Shuba would go there. And in many instances, he was instrumental in having the, uh, the sentence reduced, the guy released to his custody, so that it became known in Berlin that he was interested in individual GIs, helping them, those who had gotten into trouble. Schubau created an atmosphere in Berlin. Among the German Jews who were left there, you could never imagine that such a rabbi could exist. Uh, their notions and their... Uh, their habits with a rabbi was a sedate scholar, a quiet, methodical gentleman, whereas Shubal was all activity, all uh, emotion, all uh, overt uh, activity. I was once riding in a jeep with Shubal. We were going to the jail. I forget the name of the street we were riding on, but I recall that Schubau saw some Germans walking on one side toward us. He moved his jeep right onto the sidewalk and moved along 
uh, and a head-on collision with these Germans out of sheer devilish. <laughs> I said, Shubo, what are you doing? He says, we've got to show them who, who we are. We have to make them uh, think. One doesn't associate that kind of activity with a chaplain who was responsible for the spiritual guidance of GIs, as well as having begun to make a, an impact on the German Jewish community, the Gemeinde, which was slowly beginning to be reformed with the help of the Giants. Uh, what was his role in that? Uh, in other words, what was the joint's role and what was the role of the Jewish of uh, Shubal? Well, the role of the joint, as concerns the rebuilding of the Jewish Gemeinde, was actually that. We were able to find, and I remember the name of one of them, Bear, I forget his, la his first name, a Mr. Bear, who had been in charge of cash distribution to needy German families prior to the tremendous catastrophe there so that we brought him into the apparatus of providing relief for mm -hmm. needy German Jews many of whom had been kept alive because of their marriage to non-Jewish women or as I said before came out of the concentration camps or later on some of them who had been successful in escaping to China began to make applications to come back because they had property or uh, mm -hmm. wanted out of the universal instinct to return home. Home was Berlin and they came back and they were in need. So that with Bear and a few other wonderful old German Jews, we set up a welfare structure based on what they had had. This is this was started when you and... Uh Eli Rock and Max Helvard were there, or was this started before? Was I Gornick? think this was started by myself and uh, b with Eli Rock and myself. But Max Helvard was specifically concerned about supplies. Uh -huh. He handled the warehouses. He handled the the relationships with the uh, the Balabatim in the uh, various uh, camps. We had Schlachtenzin, we had uh, Tempelhof, and we had uh, uh, Transients. So that I think that uh, I think that it was Eli Rock and myself, and I had come out of the welfare department in the New York City and was sensitive to budgets and that sort of thing. We set up the uh, that uh, relief giving structure based on what they had done. And I come to why I repeat that in a moment. We gave out clothing. We gave out money, incidentals like cigarettes and other amenities that we had at the time. We established a fairly systematized distribution system to the people. I want to come back to the point that I said I would mention. When Bear, Mr. Bear, the wonderful Mr. Bear, would tell me about this and this family that's alive and what their needs were, when he would say, well, let us give them five marks, I would look at him and I'd say, Mr. Bear, you're talking about a different world. Five marks don't mean anything today. You can't buy anything for five marks. Let us give them what they need in relation to what their needs are today. Let us give them 20 marks. Also to help them forget a little bit of what they've been through. The generosity of the rich American, the knowledgeable American in that particular field, confronted the old habits of a German Jewish relief giver in better days. Mm -hmm. So that we, it was, it was significant that we were able to uh, get them to accept the giving of larger sums, which corresponded more or less to the needs of the people who came to the Gemeinde asking for assistance. One must never forget that the um, the supply lines of the joint only began to gather momentum later. I say it wasn't early. I mean, it was there, there was somehow rather it was too slow. A tremendous job of organization, and even then, the joint, as I recall, we talked about our SOS program which was second-hand stuff they were collecting when they finally went in to purchase things on the market. 
Then our supply line was established and became a real supply line of all kinds of uh, new clothing, uh, amenities of various kinds. And did brassiers for women, for example. They would order brassiers by the thousands or uh, various types of foodstuff were finally brought in. The joint was also receiving all kinds of parcels. People in the States were wanting to do something. And this was the uh, parcel assist, uh, package program started by the chaplain. Well, I don't know whether it was or not. Through they, all I know is that we would receive sacks of the most wonderful parcels. We would receive them. And down in, in, uh, in our hit, in our building, I forget the name of it already, we had a cellar. And we would load the cellar with the packs, and I would see to it that the, uh, the sacks were opened, and we would try to sort out the stuff. This was food, this was cigarettes, this was cigars, this was candy, this was pencils, this was this. We'd sort it out and then began to distribute it, and we tried to distribute it on a rational basis. I must say that I think that uh, if we ever found anybody taking so much as a pencil, we would, we would, we would really, we'd, uh, we'd be very severe. We, 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 we ran a clean operation there. Incidentally, when I told uh, Mr. Bear, let's give them 20 marks, our marks came to us as very cheap money mm -hmm. in those years. The money that was brought into Berlin for us to operate came in releases so that I had the money and we could do things. Our Schubau ran a program complementary. His to ours, ours to his, it doesn't matter. There was a complementary parallel program. Mm -hmm. He would run an owning Shabbat or he would run a Friday a dinner at his home. He had to have stuff. You couldn't get stuff. We had some stuff, I would ask Shubal, you'd like this, we'd give him that, and he would receive his stuff, so it made a nice Friday night. Many a night I ate gefilte fish at his home. But hole. it wasn't a competitive type of thing, was it? No, 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 we were all, there was some, the need was so great that we all wanted to do it, and we did it with open hearts, and were delighted to do it. That and Shubal did it as well, mm -hmm. to give it away with a lavish hand, really. Shubal's relationship with the... Uh, G.I.s, as I recall it now, was friendly. He was, he was, uh, he was their, their, their patron saint, if I could say that. Things that they, he prob they probably came to him to ask for things which I don't know about, I'm sure, from what, from what happened. Uh, what other contacts Shubal had with other organizations, whether uh, uh, Israeli or others, I didn't know too much about at the time. It was a good working relationship. It was fruitful. On the whole, I think that all of our efforts were bent toward alleviating the situation of our people as we found them as they came into Berlin. And why do you think he had this uh, difficulty with, the, with Philip uh, Scordia? <laughs> I can only say, really. And this is sheer uh, extrapolation on the basis of what I knew of Phil, with whom I had worked. Yeah. Desk to desk, back to back. Phil was a, a highly intelligent, given a little bit to temperamental uh, excess, because his intelligence was so quick, a very capable guy, a very able guy, and I think that the clash of these two volatile temperaments, in my judgment, must have been the cause of it. And this really is only a... But uh, uh, what about the type of job that Phil uh, Scornick did? Shubo, uh, as I mentioned to you before, wrote back to the World Jewish Congress uh, that uh, he was really just a, a baboon, they would be competent, and he was, just couldn't wait until they finally got someone competent. That's why when he heard that uh, he must have known Eli Rock uh, or you, he was uh, so happy, and he expressed this in a letter that finally, you know, the joint has put in uh, the proper people. There were two people in, the, in there before before you people got in there that, uh, that he had difficulty with. So I'm just wondering, you know, in one sense he had a wonderful relationship with you, or a very good relationship, 
and with these other people he didn't and uh, Alex maybe he was pushing too hard to begin with Shuban he would step on the toes of these people and, and reciprocal uh, animosity set up mm-hmm. remember you were dealing with a volatile guy and with all Shuban was no longer with us he died uh, he was a, not an easy guy to get along with. Mm-hmm. So that, uh, in all justice, I think that uh, Phil and Shubau uh, may have been uh, temperamentally and personally unable to get along with him. They criticized Phil. That Phil was a capable worker. And I'm sure that what he, uh, that is, I, I, I've reason to believe he wouldn't act out of character. He wouldn't become a sloppy, incompetent worker suddenly because he's working in Berlin. I, I, I would have reservations That's on that. Really. I think that may, may answer the problem. Yeah, I have reservations on that. Okay, so that the uh, activity was actually complimentary, you think? Yes, yes. In an overall sense, it was uh, complimentary, good and complimentary. And how long did you work uh, with? Shubo in this business. Do you remember any specific incidents of, uh, of great importance? Was he able to help you in any way? His unique position of, as a chaplain? If we were appealed to by uh, a DP who had done something which made it difficult for him to get into the Schlachtensee camp again yeah. because he had broken this or that regulation, because he had black marketed cigarettes, because he had uh, hit a German, the anger against, about our Jews against Germans was natural. It was a good thing for him to hit a German psychologically. Even our analysts uh, came and wrote uh, long uh, situations, long situation uh, reports on that. I would call up Shubo and I'd say, Shubo, this guy morally may, he, he may be in the wrong, all right, he did something, but we can't punish him on top of what he's lived. The scars are too open yet. Please get him back into the camp. Please see Fishbein. Please get the MP to get him into the camp. Let's get him back into the camp for this or that reason. Mm-hmm. Shubo would be helpful. And the joint couldn't do that on your own? We could. Later on, we did. Mm-hmm. This was all a developmental thing. Mm-hmm. As so I got to know the ropes around there. You didn't need the chapel. Oh, do whatever I wanted to do. He did things that... Uh, all of us did a living, did fantastic things because we lived in the world. It was a fantastic world. Do you remember some of those fantastic one, things? One, one, one day, one day, a uh, DP, little fellow, <coughs> had a, had a a valise full of cigarettes, and each carton of cigarette was worth its weight in gold for the cigarette economy, as you remember. Yeah. He was a little guy, and he had managed to corner a valise or two loaded with cigarettes. Black market. And in trying to get back into the camp in Schlachtensee, the MPs caught him. The thing developed to a point where the little fella was tough enough. The little fella was tough enough to get to Rabbi Itzkevitz who was in Schlachtensee, the rabbi there, he was a DP. Mm-hmm. And Rabbi Itzkowitz's son later on was, was came into Berlin mm-hmm. 
as part of the Jewish brigade, and then began to help in the bricha. It's for which the Israeli soldier discovered that his father was in Berlin with his uh, sister. This DP was able to get to Itzkowitz and to Shai Gebald. The MPs want to take away my, 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 my two uh, suitcases of, uh, of cigarettes. They won't let me back into the camp. Itzkowitz saw that he had a really a rough decision to make, it was a Solomon-like decision to make. What did Itzkowitz do? He came to our offices in the joint. He wanted to get us out of the, the uh, particular uh, 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 MP, uh, UNRWA camps uh, uh, environment, get it over to the joint. Well, he knew we'd be more friendly. And we were very friendly with Itzkowitz. Itzkowitz came into the office with, the, with, the, with the, uh, our uh, friend, the Jew, with the two suitcases of uh, cigarettes. And we, we sat down, and Itzkowitz made a plea for him, which I'll never forget. He made a plea for this man that was worth a lot of money, those two cigarettes, and he said, uh, the man had suffered. He's been punished enough. He's lost the family. I'm sure what he's done here is counter to the laws of this crazy military regime we're living in, but over and above that, there's a moral uh, responsibility to treat this man not as a criminal, because mm -hmm. he's not a criminal. Everybody's doing it, as Gibbett said. You people go to the bazaars and you buy your stuff for the cigarettes. He says, in what sense is he worse than you are? It took him a lot of uh, a lot of business planning to get these two suitcases of, of black market cigarettes. In other words, he developed an argumentation as a religious man, but yet with a legality which was sound, and I was very much impressed by it. So we so after listening to we said in order to get him back into the camp, we said to Iskowitz, well, what decision, what resolution of this problem can you make? The MPs will not allow him back into the camp. The, the UNRWA people will not allow him back into the camp openly, give him his room again and so on and so forth. But the two with two cartons with the two suit suitcases full of cigarettes. Iskowitz made a uh, Solomon like decision. One we take away from them, one suitcase we take away from them, or one suitcase we leave. Well, why not? We would hold it in reserve. We would hold it in reserve. They would trust us to hold the, the suitcase in reserve. For whatever needs may come up, and maybe even in time we might even give it back to him. But it was a nice solemn like decision, and Iskowitz was able to get the guy back into camp with his little fortune, even though even the one suitcase was a fortune, and we kept the other one. I mean, this is the kind of thing that went on. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Shuba wasn't in our particular decision, but these were the kinds of things that went on between an American organization like ourselves, with the chaplaincy, and with local people in the camp, like Rabbi Itzkowitz. We played a good, I think we all of us together played a good moderating role. Mm -hmm. Now, aside from Rabbi Shuba, who else did you... Uh, well, Shuba... I don't remember the exact time, really, it's slipped from my memory. Shuba was uh, succeeded by uh, Mike Abramovich. Mm -hmm. And Mike was an entirely different world. He looked like a boy of 16, he was so young. He was an ambulant guy. He, he poured out of himself uh, song, speech, poetic. He was a lyrical little, little character. And he surrounded himself with a uh, group of DPs, and he organized choir, DP choir, and he organized uh, young girls into some kind of activities, and young boys into some kind of activities. It became a, 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 a really a beehive of activity around the home that Mike Abramovich lived in. His Friday night suppers were, became, uh, became really uh, the in thing at that particular time. He was very uh, active with the GIs on his own spiritual level, religious level, as well as with members of the Jewish Gemeinde, who again found in him uh, a queer uh, specimen in the rabbinate. Young, beardless, spoke Hebrew. Mike had come from Israel, yeah. spoke Hebrew, and who uh, was outgoing, gave 
of himself and gave of the things that he had. But there was always that uh, wonder that we had, how responsible is this human being? Because of his youth, because of his, we were afraid of his immaturity. But it didn't matter. The environment he created was a uh, marvelous thing. The G.I.s liked to come there. He created a social center for them. Mm -hmm. And between Mike and ourselves, we became very friendly on a personal basis. He needed this. Extra. He got a few cans of gefilte fish. Mike, give me a few cans of gefilte fish. Get some extra cigarettes. Everybody was getting things. Mm -hmm. So that it was a complimentary activity. And we became very fond of Mike. I've seen him in Florida since. I knew a little DP girl, Rachel, that uh, yeah. that he married. And we thought it was, we wondered about it, but it turned out to be a beautiful marriage. We thought he would go back to Israel, but apparently she didn't want to. She wanted to study. But these were the personal things about Mike. But his job in Berlin was such that he, he uh, while he didn't do things like, on a level of Rabbi Friedman, he nonetheless contributed to the total effort of the Jewish chaplaincy and the American organization so of ameliorating and alleviating and helping DPs on a personal basis uh, and on a uh, morale basis, a spiritual basis. It was very helpful. Um, you needed the chaplain there. In other words, it was, a very it was very helpful for you. From my point of view, yes. Yes. What did they do that, that the joint found? Uh, in other words, you said it was complimentary. Uh, was there something in the, in the chaplaincy itself, uh, the position of the rabbi? Was it the spiritual aspect? Or what was it that... that um, made it a whole, a whole unit? You must remember, Alex, and here I speak to my own personal background. A rabbi to me was a special person. Mm -hmm. He was a, in an aura. He was a scholar. He was a saint. You went to him for advice. Judaism somehow or other was located, as I grew up, in the rabbi. He was Judaism. You want to know about Judaism? You went to the rabbi. He taught us Judaism. And he was the man who one always respected for his learning and for all the things that you know about. So that the very fact of having a chaplain, we thought was I thought was a wonderful thing, mm -hmm. a wonderful thing, that I met strange chaplains who didn't <laughs> correspond in my in my to my past notion of a chaplain. That that was obvious. Mike was a kid. I was many years older than Mike, and he was a boy to me. I, I wondered what was the what was the chaplain turning out in the United States. Cuba was a mystery to me at first. A volatile human being like my friends or me, rabbis are above that. But no, he wasn't. He was right in there fighting. He could box Cuba. He was a rough customer. And a good body on him. He moved well, and I can move very well, and he moved very well. So it was good to have them. Let's go to the chapel. Let's ask him. Let's ask his advice. It was a friendly relationship. As I remember it in Berlin, we created a wonderful, a wonderful uh, spirit in Berlin with the German Gemeinde and with the, uh, with the chaplains. Do you remember any specific incidents about the Rabbi Abramowitz? Where his position might have been helpful? Or anything? What do you think about his, it? his position was helpful in that he created a wonderful morale. In that he made living in Berlin with the DPs easy. It was song fests. The DPs, we, I learned hundreds of songs of the DPs from Mike Abramowitz. He led the songs. He coached them. He told them how to sing. That created an atmosphere, a basis. We were together again. There was hope again for us Jews. We, were, we, 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 we felt as if we were reliving mm -hmm. uh, good, good uh, possibilities and forgetting the bad things. He was instrumental in, in, in bringing together people and married them, which was a good, healthy thing. Life began to be a little happier, a little more normal, if one can use that word. Mike was instrumental in that. In a way in which, for example, let me give you an illustration of what happened 
as another aspect to with Rabbi Friedman. To show you that I, I don't know whether Mike could have handled that kind of a situation as well as Rabbi Friedman. We were all in the movies. Rabbi Friedman, with his wife Elaine, my wife and myself. Hey, guys, you're handling very okay. Yeah. I'm, you didn't know that he was divorced. Yeah. All right. You have to be careful when you say these well, things. Well, I mean, it doesn't matter. Really in any way, if Herb didn't tell you, no, I don't no, want no, that. It doesn't matter. Very good. Uh, human beings, in the end, that I came out of it a much more forgiving soul than I went into it. Anyway, we were at this. Um, we were at this movie. Right. And the movie was somewhere in town in Berlin. I forget where. And as we were all watching this movie, like a like a uh, something beginning to ripple through the audience something was happening after the thing had happened we discovered what had taken place namely a woman seated in one of the seats recognized a couple in one of the camps mm -hmm. yeah. you can imagine her reaction to the couple the hysteria that resulted and that's the couple he's the one who did this to me and he's the one who informed and he's that and the whole, or the, or the whole movie theater there arose. We, we, we broke through the, didn't see the end of the movie anymore. And we all rose. Couple was, a, was an ominous word to us. What do you do to a couple? You kill them, don't you? Some of the men in the audience, without even checking whether she wasn't in a hysteria, they jumped and got hold of this guy. Dragged him out of the movie. At that point, we rushed out, those of us, to see what we were in uniform too, remember. And Rabbi Friedman did a wonderful thing. He jumped up on his jeep, or his jeep it was, and we were around him. He jumped up on his jeep and he began to yell at these people. He got a powerful voice. Tremendous voice. Have you ever heard Rabbi Friedman speak? No. You should, from experience. He has a powerful voice and a good speaker. And he began to quiet them down. We want law and order. We want the accuser and the accused. We want to take this man. There'll be a din. He'll be judged with the evidence and everything else. And he quieted them. It was a marvelous job that he did. In that, in under those hysterical circumstances, we were alongside him, prepared to give any help. And we finally get the guy away. And they, we turned him over. And, and Rabbi Friedman was able to get him to where he wouldn't be uh, hurt. I honestly... Uh, Trying to recall, I think the woman's uh, accusations were found uh, to be uh, well grounded. Something happened to the couple, I don't know, but at least it was done in a, in a way in which we like to see things done. Whether Mike Abramovich could have done that, this is a guess, I don't know. I'm trying to think about what Mike did. Mike was friendly, Mike was sociable, Mike was organizing everything from songfests to picnics. To, he was always doing that. What Mike did in relation to whether the Bricha or the Aliyah bet, I would suspect that they used him very, very, very ably. Mm -hmm. I would suspect that that was done. Now, you weren't involved in JDC wasn't involved in the Bricha? Anymore. No, we were not. Uh, individually, uh, this or that may have uh, come by our way, and we were very helpful, of course, but uh, we're not involved. Particularly in Berlin, when the uh, pogrom broke out in Kelsey in July '46, mm -hmm. and those Jews that survived the Kelsey pogrom moved north towards Stettin, which was right over the border from uh, Berlin, Szechuan, uh, well, whatever the name was in Polish, but it was a German name, Stettin. Right. Uh, we were helpful. The boys, the uh, Aliyah Bet boys, were able to uh, move those over the border. They had no particular difficulty there. And we would give clothing, and uh, we were always there to help in that way. But the actual movement out, no. So other individual things, or an individual getting out from some particular place where he'd come to us, we would make no bones about it, give him some clothing and send them on. That was, uh, right. there was no problem. But actual involvement, other places, the joint was more involved. Um, now, Rabbi Friedman, you mentioned. Uh, yeah. Can you talk about him? Well, him? Rabbi Friedman had a special, it seemed to us at the time we were there, became fairly evident that he had a special kind of an assignment in Berlin. 
what it was uh, we didn't know or didn't didn't speak about. But he was uh, on the periphery, rather Mike Obama, which was right in the center, and everything revolved around. Herb Friedman was doing other things. Later on, we learned what some of these other things were and why he was assigned there. But while he was there, he was friendly, like settling this Kapo affair, uh, bringing together certain Israelis with, uh, with us, getting to know them personally. His relationship with Phil Bernstein would channel up to, uh, to the higher, uh, was it McCloy at the time or? Uh, McNarney. McNarney at the time, uh, where Herb was at. And Herb lived in Berlin while we were there for about six months, I remember, something like that. Helpful in a general way, uh, sociable, we became very good friends, as a matter of fact. And helpful in ways like the one I described about the couple. Otherwise, he had a very special, special work to do there, mm -hmm. about which I assume you know now yes, what yes. was done. So there's no point in repeating that to you. You know that. Certainly, it was. Uh, Unless, not of course, you can. Well, well, I had, <laughs> I had an interesting, and of course, I was not sensitive enough or aware enough to know who I was dealing with. Mm -hmm. I once got uh, instructions from uh, my headquarters. That a man by the name of Gershom Sholom was coming into uh, oh yeah, I can hear that. <laughs> coming into Berlin. I didn't know the name Gershom Sholom. I thought Sholom meant Sholom, and that's all. Yeah. Pretty ignorant in those days as to who I want Gershom, the great Gershom Sholom. But so I went to meet him. I had to provide him with a uniform, our type of uniform, without any insignia. I had to provide him with a room in our house. I had to provide him with facilities, and he would tell me what he wanted to do, something to do about books. Yeah. Well, we were delighted to do it when our office asked us to do something. I provided Gershom Shalom with a, with a uniform. I provided him with a jeep and a driver. And he would move into East Germany from Berlin to East Berlin to look for books. Well, I was too busy with, with people. This was a wonderful thing. But evenings, I had the advantage of being able and our in a, an accidental way to sit down with a great character. And I realized immediately, of course, that this was, a, this was somebody special. One day he'd had some trouble going into a basement looking for the books. He tore his uniform. I could see that he was not a man. He was more at home with books than he was with uniforms and jeans. <laughs> he was a delight, though. These, you know, these abstracted individuals are sometimes delightful. In any case, he was doing a good job uh, recuperating books from various sellers. He could tell in a minute what they were worth or what they weren't worth. We could get them, it would be packed, we'd send them to the university. We, we, we did a lot of that. Sending, mm -hmm. like Gershom showed them, and we were able to get it out very easily. So we sent lots of good books to the, to the university. I remember one evening that Gershom Shalom was explaining to me how slang was growing up in the Hebrew language. It was a delightful lecture. I learned later on who I had the good fortune to sit and listen to for a while. These were the kinds of things that we could do because uh, it would have been difficult for him otherwise. He had no status. Right. He couldn't get him. We were able to get him to uh, East uh, Berlin, Chemnitz, Halle, uh, uh, I'm forgetting the names of the cities that we used to, we used to bring in the pace of the supplies there. And the, the Russians would allow us in, but Max Elvard was our great uh, help there because he was uh, Russian-speaking. Yeah. And we were able to do that. We did all kinds of things. All kinds of things of that nature. It was a chaotic world, it was an anarchic world. One of the things we did, we were, we were, we were able to run people out of Berlin to the British Zone. We would write our own orders for them. We had the army paper. We'd write our own orders. I don't know whether you want to say these things. Yes, yes. These are the things we did. Uh, we put them into an ambulance, a JDC ambulance, and we had a little gal we called Hotshot Sally, Sally Bendrima, who worked out of uh, Bergen-Belsen in the uh, in the British zone. We'd say, Sally, you got the load of four or five today. Four, and she would ride on with them into the ambulance and go through all the guards and bring them into the British zone. And where they went on, incidentally, there was a British organization that worked in Berlin too, British Relief Union. Right. And it was the first time I ever met a, uh, a, a British chaplain, British Jewish chaplain. Who did you work? Who was that? 
he worked where he came in. Hartman? Hartman. There was a guy there responsible for them, Dixie, Trixie, Trixie. Oh, Dixie, yeah, I know. Uh, Dixie, Trixie. No, it's Dixie, yes. Uh, I forget. He's, he lives in Israel, I think. I think he now lives in Israel. Yes, yes. He was in charge of that unit. Quite a guy. Complimentary work. We overwhelmed them. We were so big and so wealthy. and well, They were doing a nice, quiet job, but a very competent job in their own way. And to them there came a British chaplain, but he was a scholarly man. He didn't okay. stay very long. Middle-aged guy, I don't remember. I don't, know. don't know him, I hope. Don't know his name. But you just recall, speaking about the British show, I don't know. We played some other roles, too. Uh, this one, I think, has the significance. An organization was created, a roof organization was created in Berlin. I forget its name. But I do remember that Leon Dannenberg of the uh, American Labor Movement, of the uh, AFL, changed his name later to Leo Dannen. He was sent in by the AFL. The Quakers sent in a representative from uh, their own organization. The JDC was represented. Uh, there was a, uh, a non-Jewish... No. Not a member of a, social, a socialist organization whose function was, when this roof organization was created, whose function was to seek to it that relief was given to the anti-Nazi Germans. Mm who had worked against the Nazis. Wonderful thing on a non-sectarian basis because there were some wonderful Germans who had given their lives fighting the Nazis. We mustn't forget that. In one of the meetings, the Quaker, don't remember his name, the Quaker said that of the supplies that we were all pooling together, or such monies as we pooled together, the Quaker insisted that there were former Nazis, whether high or low Nazis, who were terribly in need now, and that in all humanity's sake they should be given some help to. At which point we said, no. We said there are priorities in this world. They had the priorities before. They lived, they ate. Mm -hmm. uh, Jews died and didn't eat. We could not see in all ordinary terms of justice, let them get along on the German rations, but for any extra food, any extra money, we insisted that it be either for these anti-Nazi fighters or Jews. We broke. The, the Quakers wouldn't go along. We played that kind of a role. In specific instances, Leo Dannenberg went along with us. Who else was there? I forget now. It was a, quite a group, but we broke. We wouldn't. Well, that is, we we outvoted the the Quaker, mm -hmm. and we would not permit uh, food to be given to the uh, to the Nazis who were in need. All right, we'll turn over to the next slide. 